I think there's too much talk about sins, to be honest. Not enough talk about virtues. What would be your number one? I think forgiveness has been highly underrated. I forgive you. Do you forgive me? Always. There are lots of examples of Christ figures in film. From the Terminator, to Neo, to Anakin, to Harry Potter, Superman, Aslan, and even Paddington. Stories of larger-than-life characters either giving their life, living as moral examples, or being a savior in some other way have become ubiquitous in mainstream movie making. These stories help bring an objectively beautiful story of love, sacrifice, and forgiveness to both Christians and non-Christians alike. But it's not necessarily a unique kind of story. All of the characters I just listed are larger than life. The Terminator and Superman were sent to save the world, Neo, Anakin, and Harry Potter are chosen ones, Aslan was written literally to be an allegory for Jesus, and Paddington is a talking bear. So even though these movies aren't all explicitly Christian, they still fall into the mold of someone special coming in to save those who need saving because no one else can. Again, it's an important and beautiful story that is incredibly special when it works well, but it's a story about a specific kind of character that we as people are already detached from because they're not normal like us. We're probably never going to meet Jesus, Superman, Gandalf, or John Coffey in real life. So while we are getting this savior archetype, it's still an impersonal connection. This can be tough for me. I can read all about the great things that people of history have done, but it can still feel like fiction. Almost a parasocial relationship that's always going to be theoretical. It's the same reason I have trouble connecting with a god or a supernatural being through the means of faith, and why I think The Last Temptation of Christ is the best mainstream depiction of Jesus in film, since it does the best job I've seen of emphasizing his humanity and making him human and relatable. See, I used to be a staunch Christian. I believed Jesus was the Son of God and that he came down from heaven to die on a cross so I could live a shame and guilt-free life. These days, I'm not so sure what I believe. But I don't study the Bible or Christian faith the way I used to. Religion has become too impersonal for me to completely relate to. I can't wrap my head around a God whose sole mean of relationship is through believing in someone I'll never see in the flesh. And yet somehow, I'm always intrigued by movies about Christianity or explicitly Christian ideals. This is where In Bruges and Calvary come in. In Bruges is a 2008 film starring Colin Farrell, Brendan Gleeson, and Ray Fiennes, and is written and directed by Martin McDonough, while Calvary is a 2014 film also starring Brendan Gleeson and Kelly Riley, and is written and directed by Martin McDonough's brother, John Michael. While the brothers have very unique filmmaking styles, particularly in their ability to make dark comedies, they explore similar themes through their six total feature films. The brothers, who are only three years apart in age, were born in Ireland but moved to London when they were children, where they attended Catholic schools. But they both moved away from their faith at a pretty young age. And that's what I want to talk about when it comes to the two movies here. In Bruges and Calvary are both heavily religious while also quite secular. So for a quick recap of the two films. In Bruges follows two hitmen named Ray and Ken as they're sent to Bruges, Belgium after Ray accidentally botched his first job as a hitman by killing a child. Ken is sort of Ray's mentor and tells him the reason they're in Bruges at all is so they can lay low while things quiet down after Ray's botched job. But after a few days of seeing the sights in the city and Ray going on a date with a local woman, their boss Harry calls Ken and tells him he needs to kill Ray, because even hitmen have a moral code, and killing a kid completely goes against it. If I had killed a little kid, accidentally or otherwise, I wouldn't have thought twice. I'd have killed myself on the fucking spot. Ken almost goes through with killing Ray, but he sees Ray as suicidal as it is, which causes him to have compassion for him, and he sends him away to be safe from Harry's wrath. But on the train, Ray is identified to the police by a Canadian man who he had punched earlier at a restaurant, and the police take him back to Bruges. We're taking you back to Bruges. Brilliant. Chloe, Ray's date from earlier, bails him out of jail. But this is at the same time that Harry is arriving in the city to take care of Ken. Ken and Harry go to the top of the bell tower in a busy part of town so as to not make a big scene in front of all these people. At the top of the tower, Harry's alerted that Ray's back in Bruges, which leads him to shoot Ken. As Harry runs down the stairs of the tower to go after Ray, Ken makes peace with his life and throws himself from the tower to warn Ray of what's about to happen. After a chase sequence, Harry still shoots Ray, but only to realize in a moment of dark irony that he's also shot a dwarf who he thinks is a child, so he puts a gun to his head and ends his life. In an ambiguous ending, Ray is taken away in an ambulance with his own voiceover saying, and I really, really hoped I wouldn't die. Calvary begins with an Irish priest named Father James in a confessional. A man who we don't see comes in and says, as a child, he was sexually abused by a priest who has since died. And because he hasn't been able to move past his anger and shame, he wants to kill a good priest because that would actually make a point. The man says Father James has a week before they're to meet on a beach so he can go through with the act. This kind of serves as a cold open before the movie really starts with James's daughter Fiona arriving to visit him from London. 
Before he was a priest, he'd been married and had a daughter. But once his wife died, he entered into the priesthood and his daughter's mental health declined because he wasn't there for her the way he should have been. So upon her arrival in Ireland, it's revealed that Fiona was now recovering from a failed suicide attempt. Apart from reconnecting with his daughter, James spends his days doing pastoral work for his parishioners. He brings some necessities to an old man, confronts a man who struck his unfaithful wife, talks to a rich man whose family has left him, and performs last rites for a man dying from a car accident. He also comforts the wife of the dying man, visits a former pupil who's in jail for Jeffrey Dahmer type crimes, and talks to a young man considering suicide. All of this time we see that Father James really is a good man who only has the well-being of his congregation at heart, but the would-be killer is tormenting him by killing his dog and burning down his church. On the day before he's meant to meet the killer at the beach, he actually considers leaving the town, but something convinces him to go through with it. So on a fateful day on his way to the beach, he talks to some of his parishioners one more time before calling Fiona, where they have the conversation I showed at the beginning of the video. On the beach, we find that it was the abusive husband Jack who then puts a gun to James's head and pulls the trigger. And then the movie ends like this. So, now that I have those breezy summaries out of the way, let's tie it back to what I was saying at the top. In both of these movies, Brendan Gleeson's characters play the role of the sacrificial lamb, and you can even make the argument that there are character stand-ins for God the Father, Jesus, and humankind. And in Bruges, Ray has committed the ultimate unintentional sin. While he is a hitman, it's set up that way more to place the characters in a position to question morals than to condemn their behavior. You, you set up the dynamic of hitmen to talk about something completely different. And, and there aren't, I guess, many jobs in the world where people kill people and would then have to be forced to question that. There are co they're convenient characters to, to hang a story on, I think. Because while Ray is certainly rough around the edges, he's not ill-intentioned or even a bad person. In fact, he's absolutely guilt-ridden to the point that he's ready to kill himself. I will always have killed that little boy. That ain't ever going away, ever, unless maybe I go away. He's the stand-in for humans who, in Christian tradition, are inherently sinful, while not always intentionally evil. Harry is like the Old Testament God. He's angry and quick to judgment. And Ray even doubts Harry's commitment to them like so many people do with God. You know, sometimes I think Harry doesn't even give a shit about us at all. But Ken is kind, compassionate, and forgiving, and tries to give Ray a sense of purpose. Get out of this business and try to do something good. You're not going to help anybody dead. You're not going to bring that boy back, but you might save the next one. While Harry is dead set on making Ray pay, Ken strongly advocates for giving him a chance to be different. The boy has the capacity to change. The boy has the capacity to do something decent with his life. Ken puts down the gun and he sets the example. Ray is still shot and his fate is uncertain, but he repeats that he doesn't want to die. Ken's helped to give his life some sort of meaning and example to follow. In a 1998 interview with Bomb Magazine, Martin McDonough mentioned his interest in a suicidal Christ figure who kills himself for the sake of others. He was asked about this quote almost 20 years later in 2017 for an interview with The Federalist regarding In Bruges, and he said he'd never really thought about it in relation to Ray and Ken. The popular interpretation of the film is that Bruges functions as a purgatorial state for Ray, which is completely textual and I'm not denying. I just think there's also a very textual interpretation to be made about this suicidal Christ figure who believes so strongly in the concept of forgiveness and a person's ability to change, that he gives his life so someone else can keep theirs. Ken isn't Superman or Harry Potter. He wasn't destined to come and save Ray. He's just a normal guy, with his own moral failings, who has learned the value of second chances and forgiveness, which he in turn tries to pass on to Ray. And by the end, he does so. In Christian teaching and tradition, after Jesus died as the suicidal Christ figure McDonough has noted, that's when Christianity really began to gain traction. Jesus' apostles lived their lives with him, and some were present at his death. Seeing him go through his life and death is what led them to change, and consequently, what allowed Christianity to thrive and prosper. Similarly, with Ray, he spent his time with Ken, starting out as a guilt-ridden, irreverent drunk until he finally confronted what he'd done. It's Ken's repeated reassurance and ultimate sacrifice that allowed Ray to see that he didn't need to let this awful tragedy define him, and it led him to have a total change of mindset at the end of the movie. Ray learned from something terrible. It's not an erasure of what he did, but it's allowing him to take what he learned to go forth and make himself better. It's the same thing with Father James and Fiona. Fiona returns to her father's life broken and holding on to hurt which he unintentionally inflicted on her in the past. She observes his faithfulness to his church and they begin to reconcile their differences. While there is evil and despair all around, James is able to stay largely steadfast. As it's put here in this movie's behind the scenes, We encounter the same population that Jesus encountered. People who are 
trying hard, people who are failing, and other people who are searching. And he's there for every single one of them. Then by the end, when they're on the phone before James goes down to the beach, they have their conversation about forgiveness, which leads to Fiona trying so hard to smile at Jack during the prison visit. She doesn't yell, ask why, or lose her temper in some other way. She remembers her final conversation with her father and tries to show the virtue he'd shown so many times before. In a previous conversation with his daughter, James told her he'd always be there for her in her heart. I'll always be here. You promised. I'll always be here. And you'll always be here. It's much like my favorite lesson from the Harry Potter universe. Watch the lovers never really leave us. James wasn't a good father after the death of his wife, but he certainly wasn't a bad one either. He and his daughter have real, true, deep love for each other, and it shows. With his death, he continues to live inside her, and his spirit is able to continue. Just like the spirits in Harry Potter, and more notably, Christ himself inside Christians. Fiona changes and basically functions as a stand-in for the disciples, living out the message of Jesus after his death. Even the eventual killer knows how good Father James is. There's no point in killing a bad priest, but killing a good one. That'd be a shock now. They wouldn't know what to make of that. I'm going to kill you, Father. I'm going to kill you because you've done nothing wrong. I'm going to kill you because you're innocent. Much like Harry and in Bruges, Jack plays the role of a twisted Old Testament type of God. Knowing James is good is like knowing Jesus is good. It serves the same sacrificial lamb purpose. He could have killed another corrupt priest or tried to get justice a long time ago, but that was never the point. The real motive was to make a point and to get people's attention. He wasn't motivated the same way God was in the Bible, but his actions had a similar effect. It wasn't just an eye for an eye. It was a good person taking the pain and penalty that he didn't actually deserve so that he could be an example for people to follow. The movie is called Calvary, and while that term is never specifically mentioned in the movie, it carries a lot of weight and meaning. It's the place where Jesus was killed. It's the culmination of everything he had come to represent on earth, just like it was the culmination of everything that Father James was to the people of his church. The McDonough brothers have crafted two flawed characters, two flawed people, who are still able to bring forgiveness, redemption, and even salvation in a way that you don't expect to see, especially not in movies with tones like these. The McDonough's are kind of like Martin Scorsese, in that their work is often implicitly spiritual, if not explicitly so. Obviously, Scorsese is known as one of the best filmmakers of all time, and with good reason, and is about six and a half times more prolific than the McDonough's combined when it comes to the total number of films. But I still like the comparison. All three generally make movies with and about characters who, on the surface, are morally reprehensible, but the movies still have a lot to say about faith and Christianity in general. Before becoming a filmmaker, Scorsese even intended to become a Catholic priest. But the McDonough's have done something specific with this unofficial duology. They make the redemptive Christ figure just a normal guy. They allow you to put your faith in something or someone tangible. The story and teachings of Jesus are wonderful and beautiful, but he's literally God. If you're like me, that's way too far out of reach to grab onto as a source of a person's worth and value. I have trouble connecting with God, but movies like these give me hope that there are people out there who are willing to show me this kind of love and forgiveness, or that I'll have a chance to show it to someone else. It's not always going to mean someone's life, but it could mean a major sacrifice. The idea that Jesus is God is still too much for me to wrap my head around. As much as I want to and as much as I've tried, I've been unable to come to a conclusion either way about whether or not I believe in the story of the Gospels. I love Jesus' humanity as portrayed in The Last Temptation for Christ, but that's approaching it from a Christian and religious perspective, whereas I'm approaching it from a secular and non-religious standpoint. I love the core of his teachings, but not the layers of religiosity that have stemmed from it. Looking at it from this non-Christian perspective, Ken and Father James represent what I believe to be the best of humanity. John 15, 13 says, There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And this is exactly what Ken and James do. They're representing what I'd like to believe about God. For as human as he's portrayed in The Last Temptation, Jesus is still holy God, which I have trouble connecting to. Ken and James are flawed people doing selfless things. They are two people like me or you who are not a deity, superhuman, or magical. They're just a couple of guys who can provide hope and inspiration and humanity to people like me. Martin McDonough has said that he lost his faith at 12, but he's still obviously very influenced by the Catholic teachings, which is something I can really relate to. In Calvary or in Bruges, it's incredibly encouraging to see a person think that another person is worth sacrificing themselves for. It's more relatable, it's more grounded. It shows that as people, we can be both inspired by others and inspiring to others. It makes me think that my own life and the lives of those around me have intrinsic worth just because we're all people and not because a greater being told us so. People are tangible. I can grab onto the idea of a person where I can't always with the idea of a God. Ken and Father James aren't going to come back to life. They weren't always prophesied to make their sacrifices. It's an action that they can't take back, but they perform because they believe so strongly in it. 
They're men coming from completely different walks of life, one religious and one secular, but they still have compassion and a completely sacrificial attitude. And no matter their background or motivation, they believe people are worthy of being forgiven and worthy of being redeemed.